As you may have deduced from the title of this video, I am starting a new series on Hawking radiation. This topic will take several videos to explore as it requires an understanding of not only the general relativity but also quantum field theory. So naturally, we will begin a crash course in quantum field theory. I'm assuming that you are already familiar with quantum mechanics and second quantization. If you're not, I recommend you check out the channel via science. The link is in the description. This channel has many videos on the subject of general relativity and quantum mechanics. The material there is very good, so check it out. Throughout this video, I will be using units in which the speed of light and the Planck constant are both one. So first, let's ask the question, what is quantum field theory and why do we need it? The first part of this question is easy. A quantum field is just what it sounds like. A field that is quantized. But what exactly does it mean for something to be quantized? In quantum mechanics, classical particles, which have definite positions and momenta, are quantized by replacing the positions and momenta with operators, whose commutation relations are these. The notion of a quantized field is very similar to this. In the classical field theory, the state of a field is described by a number, say phi, at each point in space and time. In the case of particles, the indices on X label the particles. In the case of a field, it is the X that does the labeling. So phi is like X and X is like the index J. We'll get to the question of how to quantize a field. But first, let's answer the second part of this question. Why do we need quantized fields? After all, we know there are such things as particles, which can be described just fine by the Schrodinger's equation. So what can a quantized field do for us that the wave function can't? There is really only one reason why the conventional Schrodinger formalism is insufficient to describe fundamental physics, which is this. The Schrodinger's equation is non-relativistic, or, put another way, it is not Lorentz invariant. This is a source of two problems. First, we know from observation that the number of particles in nature is not conserved. This is a consequence of the mass-energy relation E equals mc squared. The Schrodinger's equation, in its conventional form, is not equipped to deal with this fact because, in order to use it, we must specify the number of particles beforehand. But there is no mechanism within this formalism that takes changes in particle numbers into account. We must write a new Schrodinger's equation each time we increase or decrease the number of particles. The second problem, due to the non-relativistic nature of the Schrodinger's equation, is that it violates causality. For example, if we start with a probability distribution of a localized particle, that's moving with a group velocity comparable but smaller than the speed of light, the front tail of the probability distribution can arrive at the detector earlier than the light beam that was sent out at the same time and from the same point as the particle. If we keep repeating this experiment, eventually we will detect a particle before the light has arrived at the detector. In other words, the particle will have traveled faster than light. So clearly, a new theory is needed that will fix these problems. But you might be asking, why a field theory and not something else? One of the reasons why physicists at the time were looking for a field theoretic approach to quantum mechanics is that they had already quantized the electromagnetic field. And since physicists like to unify things, they wanted to see if all other particles could be described as excitations of different fields. So, how do we go about constructing a field theory? We can look to Lagrangian mechanics for inspiration. In the Lagrangian approach, we write down an action, S, which is some functional of the system variables, where L is called the Lagrangian. The Lagrangian is a function of the system variables and their time derivatives, 
In the canonical formalism of classical mechanics, we define a canonical momentum P for the ith particle as the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to xi dot. I'm using a shorthand notation for the partial derivative with respect to the x, y and z coordinates. The dynamics of this system are governed by these equations, where h is the Hamiltonian, defined like this. You can find this stuff in any graduate level book on classical mechanics if you need a quick review. So, we can derive the equations of motion from the Lagrangian by following this procedure. Now we need the rules of quantization, which are pretty simple. Take the variables p and x and turn them into operators that satisfy these commutation relations. Notice that in going from classical to quantum, we did not change anything here. The way we derive a quantum system is exactly the same as for the classical system. Choose a Lagrangian and follow this procedure. But in addition to this, we need to impose these commutation rules. Getting back to classical systems, you might be thinking, why bother with Lagrangians and Hamiltonians? Why not just write down Newton's equations and be done with it? And you would be right. Kind of. There are two ways in which the Lagrangian approach is superior to that of Newton. One. For some systems, writing down Newton's equations may be very difficult. For example, what are the Newton's equations for a system consisting of two pendula? To answer this, you would have to identify all the forces acting on each ball. But since forces are vectors, you need to figure out their components along the radial and angular directions, which can get quite complicated. The forces due to the spring, for example, point at some angles phi1 and phi2 subtended by the radial components that are functions of the two angles theta1 and theta2. That alone takes some effort to work out. Then you have to figure out the tensions in the strings by setting the radial components to zero, etc. However, if you use Lagrangian mechanics, you just need to figure out the kinetic and potential energies of the system, and you're done. No need to worry about directions and tensions and all that annoying stuff. The second way in which the Lagrangian approach is superior to that of Newton is that it allows us to infer conservation laws just by looking at its symmetries. A symmetry is simply a transformation of some kind that leaves a system unchanged. For example, for a system of mutually attracting particles, such as a planetary system, the Lagrangian is given by this. Looking at this expression, we see that it has at least three symmetries. Translational symmetry, rotational symmetry, and time translation symmetry. Translational symmetry means that if we shift our coordinate system by an arbitrary vector, the Lagrangian remains unchanged. To see this, notice that by shifting our coordinate system by some vector s, the system variables x prime can be expressed in terms of the old coordinates x as x minus s. And since the derivative of constant is zero, x dot will be equal to x prime dot. Also, because the potential energy consists of differences between the position vectors of the particles, it too remains unchanged. What about rotation? Rotating our coordinate system around an arbitrary axis by an arbitrary angle chi is the same as rotating each position vector around the same axis by minus chi. The relation between the primed and unprimed position vectors is this, where R is a unitary rotation matrix. We could go through the algebra to show that this type of transformation does not change the Lagrangian, or we could just realize that rotations do not change the length of vectors. The time translation symmetry can be discerned simply by looking at the explicit time dependence of the Lagrangian. This Lagrangian has none. Okay, so what does this have to do with conservation laws? And what is being conserved? 
we could show that these symmetries imply the following equations. In other words, they imply that the quantities in the parentheses are conserved. This one we call linear momentum, this one's called angular momentum, and this one we defined earlier and called it a Hamiltonian. It's also known as canonical energy. I would love to show you a detailed proof of all this, but it would make this video way too long and slightly off topic. For now, we just need to remember that symmetries in a Lagrangian leads to conservation laws. And it makes no difference whether we are talking about particles or fields. If we want our system to respect conservation laws, then this Lagrangian must have these and potentially other symmetries. So, to construct a quantum field theory, we start with a classical field that has the three symmetries we just discussed and, in addition, since we are looking for a relativistic field theory, is also Lorentz invariant. Invoking the correspondence between fields and particles, we use the canonical quantization rules to quantize the field. Pi here is the canonical momentum of the field, which must be derived from a field Lagrangian. Notice that the correspondence between particles and the field phi is not one to one. First of all, we are treating x and p as time-independent operators, whereas the field is a time-dependent operator. This is not really a problem, since x and p can be represented in the Heisenberg picture, in which it is the operators that evolve with time, not the states. Second, the field variable phi is a scalar, it has only one component, unlike the vector x, which has three. A better analogy would have been a one-dimensional system of particles, where the particles are labeled with three indices. This, however, does not change the quantization rules we laid out earlier. To avoid making the upcoming expressions too cluttered, I will omit t in the argument of phi. We will keep in mind that phi is a function of x and t. So, now that we have all the ingredients to quantize a field and to derive its equations of motion, all we need is the Lagrangian. For a system of particles, the kinetic energy is the sum of the kinetic energies of the individual particles. We will assume this to be the case for a field as well. Let us expand this term in powers of phi dot, where k1, k2 and so on are the Taylor coefficients. We can set the first coefficient to zero, since by definition kinetic energy is zero if nothing is changing with time. K1 can also be set to zero, because phi dot can be both positive and negative, which for small phi dot would make the kinetic energy negative. Okay, what about potential energy? This is a tough one because we have no idea how the field at one point interacts with itself at another point. However, we can figure out some of the terms that the field must have by imposing symmetry, in particular Lorentz invariance. We can tell immediately that the kinetic energy is not Lorentz invariant. This makes sense, since in different frames things move at different rates. However, the Lagrangian must be Lorentz invariant. That means that the potential energy must contain terms which, when coupled with the terms in the kinetic energy, makes the Lagrangian Lorentz invariant. It is easy to show that adding this term will make this sum Lorentz invariant. I will leave it as an exercise. For the second term, and this I will also leave as an exercise, you will see that it is impossible to find a counterterm that will make this sum Lorentz invariant unless it contains phi dot, which we don't want in our potential. And the same will be true for higher order terms. So we have no choice but to conclude that our kinetic energy term is this and the potential has only one term that involves spatial derivatives of phi. Now we just have to figure out this last term V. We have two kinds of terms that could make up V. 1. We could write down some function of phi. If this was the only term we add, 
we would have a local field theory, meaning the field at x is influenced only by an infinitesimal volume around x. But we could also add a term like this, which would turn this into a non-local field theory, meaning the field at x is influenced by a finite volume surrounding x. There are two reasons not to add this type of term, though. One reason is that a non-local field theory is inherently non-relativistic. That's because what this term is telling us is that the field at x is affected by the field at point y instantaneously. This obviously violates causality. This is why Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism and the general theory of relativity are field theories that are local. The second reason is that this type of term would make our field theory effective, not fundamental. What I mean by that is this. A non-relativistic quantum field theory of electrons that interact via the Coulomb potential can be described by this Hamiltonian. Here the field happens to be complex. What makes this theory effective is the integration kernel here. Why is it 1 over the distance between the particles? Why not the distance squared, or an exponential, or something else? There is no explanation that comes from this theory itself. However, a local theory known as quantum electrodynamics, which couples the electron field to the electromagnetic field, gives rise to this Coulomb term naturally. Once you write down this Lagrangian, no other assumptions are necessary. So, we have two good reasons to stick to local field theories, albeit the second reason comes from hindsight. However, we still don't know what this function is. We're stuck. And what do physicists do when they're stuck? They expand things in Taylor series, like so. We can group these terms together, since they are of the same order on phi. We can now write down the Hamiltonian. from which we obtain the equations of motion. If you're unsure as to how I obtain these terms, watch the appendix at the end of this video. If we take this term and plug it in here, we get an equation for phi. Let's rearrange it a little. Well, it seems that we're stuck again, because we don't know what k2 and the alphas are. What we can do is explore possibilities. Suppose we set all alphas except for alpha 2 to 0. That gives us a nice linear equation. It is called the Klein-Gordon equation. As you can tell from its name, it was first derived by Schrödinger. Because it's linear, its solution can be written as a sum of plane waves. The a's here are complex numbers. The reason we need two terms that are complex conjugates of each other is that phi is real. And in order to express the solution in terms of plane waves, we must add these two terms. Plugging the solution back into the Klein-Gordon equation, we obtain omega in terms of k. Now we need to quantize phi using the rules of quantization, which we have established earlier, where pi is 2k2 phi dot. Plugging these expressions into the commutator, we get this. It's clear that if phi is to be an operator, then the a's must be operators that satisfy these commutation relations. Let's plug them in and see that this is indeed correct. Integrating over Q and then over K, we indeed obtain the correct commutation relation of phi and pi. We can make these commutation relations even nicer by defining lowercase a and a star. So finally, we have the field operator. Before we discuss the meaning of the operators a and a star, 
Let's work out the Hamiltonian. We know that pi is simply 2k2 phi dot. So these two terms combine to this. We must compute these three terms separately. Let's plug in the field operator into the first term and see what we get. There. Integrating over x we get and then over q Following the same steps, we can work out the other two terms. Plugging them into the Hamiltonian, we end up with this expression. Recalling what omega is, you can check that this term in fact vanishes. While this term combines to 2 omega, leaving us with a nice expression that is time independent, as we would expect of a Hamiltonian. We can make it even nicer by changing the order of the operators here via the commutation relation. So, finally, we get a Hamiltonian of this form. We will discuss this constant in the appendix. For now, let's focus on this term. Does it look familiar to you? It is in fact the Hamiltonian for independent harmonic oscillators with the only difference being that here we have an integral and not a discrete sum, and the labels are three vectors. So, in fact, the operators A and A star are just the creation and annihilation operators acting on a number state. The product A star A is the number operator, so the number state is in fact the eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. A multiparticle state can be constructed by acting with the creation operator on the vacuum, which can be defined by this relation. Let's look at the action of our Hamiltonian on this state. First, let's consider a state of one particle with momentum q. The action of this part of the Hamiltonian on this state is we can use the commutation relation to rewrite this product. The first term becomes zero when it acts on a vacuum. You can do a similar exercise for the multiparticle state. The result will be this. This looks exactly like the energy of free relativistic particles, provided we set beta to m squared. So, starting with this Lagrangian and applying the rules of quantization leads to the relativistic Hamiltonian for free particles. The constant k2 is irrelevant, but the convention is to set it to one half. The upshot of all this is that we can interpret particles as excitations of a field, much like we interpret photons to be the excitations of the electromagnetic field. In the appendix, which is coming up presently, I will fill in some of the gaps I left in the video. So don't go anywhere. So earlier in the video, we took a derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to phi, and also a derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to phi dot. And I said that the result was this, where we first expanded this potential term in phi. So, the way you take a derivative with respect to a function under integration is very much the same as taking a derivative of a variable under a summation, where the derivative of one independent variable with respect to another independent variable is the Kronecker delta function. For integration, this Kronecker delta becomes the Dirac delta. Everything else follows. So, let's take this derivative here. In the Hamiltonian, these terms contain only phi dot and pi, so we can ignore them. We only need to take a derivative of these. Now let's work out this term. This one is a bit trickier because of the derivative with respect to x, but we can deal with that by simply remembering the definition of a derivative 
plugging this back into the integrand and integrating by parts we end up with this and that's how this term came to be you can work out this one by yourselves the next thing I wanted to discuss is this constant in the Hamiltonian which of course is infinite it's actually worse than that it's infinite squared this is a disturbing result but only on a philosophical level since in quantum mechanics it is only energy differences that matter not absolute energies also we should not be surprised by this result here's why recall where this delta at zero came from it arose from this commutation relation but the only reason why this commutation relation is a Dirac delta and not a Kronecker delta is that we chose our solution to the Klein-Gordon equation to be an integral over continuous momenta k. This choice was the result of the assumption that the three-dimensional volume of space we are working in is infinite. If we had chosen our space to be a finite box, then instead of an integral, we would have a sum in which the volume of the box appears in the denominator. The commutation relation would then be this. So we can get rid of one of the infinities by making our universe finite. The second infinity arises from the fact that the space is continuous, which is reflected in the infinite range of the momentum. If we had constructed a discrete field theory, one that lived on a lattice, there would be a momentum cutoff and this term would be finite. So effectively, we have constructed a quantum field theory by placing quantum harmonic oscillators at every point in space, each with a finite ground state energy. Are we really surprised that the ground state of the whole field is infinite? Quantum field theory is a huge subject and there are many things that we could discuss here, such as causality, which I hinted at earlier, but we are interested in Hawking radiation and what we covered so far should be sufficient to tackle this subject. So I will stop here. Thank you for watching and I will see you in the next video.